Okay, let's get started. I've got a lot to cover. So um, once again, I'm Sandy Fox. Um, I am the founder of Smart as a Fox LLC, a digital strategy firm and Smart as a Fox mobile messaging. Um, and I have over 14 years of digital strategy experience in the political and nonprofit world. Um, I've been doing this a long time. Um, and I fell in love with texting back in 2013. Uh, and I've been doing texting for organizations since then. I started Planned Parenthood's texting program and Vote.org's texting program. Right now doing a bunch of work um, around texting for the census. Throughout this training at different parts, I will ask if you have any questions, please put those questions into the Q&A um, and I'll, I'll have those read to me so that I can respond. Also, at different points, I'll ask you to respond um, with your thoughts in the chat. So please feel free to do that. Um, I already see a couple uh, uh, notes in the chat from our host um, to abide by our community guidelines. So please make sure uh, to do that as well. Okay, let's get started. So what are we gonna cover today? Number one, why mobile? Why is everyone using mobile uh, for their organization, for their campaigns, and how can you, if you don't already have a mobile program, make the case to start a mobile program for your organization. We're gonna go over some key terms. We're gonna cover peer-to-peer -peer versus broadcast texting, which is the dominant two types of texting in the space. When we go into that, we're gonna talk about identifying your resources, needs, and audiences to determine which type of texting maybe makes the most sense for your organization maybe one, maybe both. We're gonna go on a breakdown between the differences. And then we're gonna go over some different platform options and I'm gonna give you a little insight into those platforms since I've demoed a lot of them. Then we're gonna cover growth strategies, best practices and use cases for texting. So a lot, again, jam-packed. Um, so I will be asking again throughout if you have any questions because I know I'm throwing a lot at you. Um, so please be prepared to ask those um, when, when you need to. And if I don't get to them immediately, I will get to them at the end. Okay, so let's jump in. So let's cover the basics first. Why mobile? First of all, almost everyone is on mobile. 96% of Americans have a, a mobile device, right? Um, of those, 88% have a smartphone. So there still is that gap between those who have like a regular um, flip phone uh, as we used to have and those who have a smartphone with apps and, and more data. So the one equalizing variable is texting um, because both types of phones can receive text messages or SMS. The other key thing, it's by far the best direct response communications tool out there. When we send a text message, within 90 seconds, 90% 90 of those who are sent it will read it. So again, people are gonna be reading your message within 90 seconds of receiving it. Comparatively to email, of course, that's, that's huge because we see very low open rates now um, on email across the board comparatively to what they used to be. And now on top of that, we get more responses. So when we send an email um, with a link or we send a text message with that same link, the text message is, with that link is gonna get four times as many clicks as that same message uh, that, it, that is in um, an email. So again, four times as many clicks on a link via a text message. On top of that, when we do uh, mobile campaigns with uh, click to calls or calling campaigns, you're actually gonna see nine times as many calls made when you send the ask out via text versus via email. And that's mainly because they're already on the device they need to, to use to take that action. Um, so again, it is by far the best direct response communications tool out there. It's engaging, right? We're actually having a one-on-one -on -one conversation, unlike email or some forms of social media where we're talking at people. With text, we can actually have a back and forth, whether it's automated or there's a person on the other end responding, right? So we're having question and answer back and forth. 
And it's also great for rapid response. Think about when you have a big moment, right? Maybe a Supreme Court decision or legislative um, result comes through or the candidate you're um, working for, their opponent makes a big blunder and you need to get it out to the masses as quickly as possible, right? To draft an email or a press release, right? That can take a while. You have to draft it, you have to get it approved. And depending on your approval process, that could take an hour to, or even a full day, right? And then you have to like build it and get it out, right? A text message is 160 characters, takes 30 minutes to draft, approve, and get out the door. Now, even if you don't have, for instance, an action ready to go at that time, you can still get out the information as an announcement via text to prompt them for action later. So for instance, Supreme Court decision, you tell them right away, hey, the Supreme Court just came down with this decision um, against this thing, right? Be, uh, stay, stay tuned for ways for you to take action. Then later that afternoon or the next day, you can send another text with that action. They're ready to go and they're riled up because they want to do that, right? Same thing with unions. If you're going on strike, texting is the best way to reach your members to let them know where that action is going to be if they're going on strike. It's also the best way to reach communities of color and rural communities that have limited access to broadband. These are communities we call smartphone dependent which means they are literally dependent on their mobile devices to have access to the internet and for basic communications. Now, on top of that, communities of color actually text more than whites. In fact, the Latinx community texts 1.56 times more than whites and the black community texts 2.24 times more than whites. So we like to say we, we're meeting people where they are, right? We're not only meeting people where they are in this case, but we're also meeting, uh, texting them on their preferred method of communication, right? So we're, we're communicating with them um, in the best way possible um, to reach these individuals. Okay, let's move on. So if folks want to use the chat and let me know uh, what uh, do you know the difference between SMS and MMS? Respond yes or no, or if you know the difference, type it in. Feel free to just jump in there. You'd be surprised how many people are not familiar. Okay, maybe chat's not working for you guys. So we'll just keep going. So SMS is an acronym for short message service and it's strictly text-based. So this is what people think of when they get a basic text message, right? Um, but MMS, it stands for Multimedia Message Service. And this is when you get text messages that have images or GIFs in it. Um, so for instance, on the right is an example of an MMS. And if I remove that image, just the text, the link would be an SMS. By having that image, it makes it an MMS. Now the important thing about SMS versus MMS is MMS, when you're sending in mass text, um, it costs more. MMS typically costs um, at wholesale two cents a text compared to less than one cent. Um, or for uh, some costs, it's up, up to six cents or more per text, whereas standard cost for SMS is one to two cents. So we're talking about three times the cost to send an MMS message. So when you're considering sending an MMS, you wanna th think about if it's actually adding more to your message, um, if you're gonna likely get more responses. For instance, HRC might um, send out a fundraising ask with an image of a t-shirt from their store that they're trying to get people to purchase as a fundraising push. By having that image there, they were able to get more people uh, to actually purchase that shirt and therefore fundraised more money. So there is a time and a place for when an image is makes sense. The other key thing with MMS is that you're not restricted to 160 characters in the same way you are with SMS um, because it is they basically are sending an image of the entire text. Um, so you aren't restricted in your character count. Okay, do we have any questions yet? Okay, I'm seeing none. 
Next up, we're going to talk about short code, long code versus toll free. A short code is a five to six digit number that's approved by all the phone carriers for what we call application to person or bulk texting. Okay. Now, for instance, the very beginning of this training, I had an example of a short code. I asked you to text NN20 to 66539, right? Now, when I say it's approved by all the phone carriers, I mean every carrier signs off on that short code being used for bulk texting to send to more than one person at once. So Verizon signs off, T-Mobile, Sprint, AT&T, et cetera. And it, you have to go through a long process to get that short code approved for mass text. Long codes are basic regular 10 digit phone numbers. And this is primarily used for one-on-one -on -one texting via application or person. So this is used for peer-to-peer um, -peer texting um, when you are pressing send on every message and for just you and me texting, right? Um, and the big thing with long codes is that the carriers do not approve long codes currently for bulk messaging. So if you are using a uh, platform that is having you send messages to more than one person at once um, with a regular phone number, most of your messages are not going through because the carriers are blocking it. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Next up is toll free. Most of you are familiar with 800 numbers, right? These are basic 10 digit numbers and they can be used for bulk texting. So sending to more than one person at once or one-on-one -on -one messaging. So uh, toll free is the great, great equalizer. Um, it's the best option and the most affordable option um, to send messages. Now, the difference between toll free and a short code for bulk messaging um, is that with a short code, your messages go out much quicker. Uh, so if you have a very large list, um, it can send more messages per second and per minute than a toll free number. But if your list is not that large, toll free is just fine. Um, short codes can be up to uh, $500 to $1,500 a month, whereas a toll free number is about $2 a month. So it's a huge difference. But a short code is also uh, easier for people to remember if you're trying to collect opt ins. Um, and we'll talk a little more about that as well. Next up, we're going to talk a little bit about warm versus cold texting. So when you think about warm texting, can anyone put in the chat what they what they believe is warm texting? Not a very talkative bunch this afternoon. Okay, so warm texting um, means that you have a relationship with the people that you're texting. Maybe it's uh, a donor or a supporter or uh, a customer, a patient. Uh, so again, you have an existing relationship. And usually, it, they have actually opted in to receive text messages from you. So not only do you have a relationship and they have a relationship with your organization or campaign, um, but they also likely have opted in and asked to receive text messages from you. But that's not always the case. So again, warm texting, you have a relationship. Cold texting is when you are texting someone who has no idea who you are. And cold texting is, to, is the only way to do cold texting is peer to peer. Uh, and so the key thing with cold texting versus warm texting is that if you do have a relationship, you are more likely to get responses. Um, you are more likely uh, to have engagement uh, from those individuals uh, because they are already familiar with your organization. Whereas cold texting, you know, it's like your basic field organizing, you're going door to door, you're making phone calls, they have no idea who you are. And if they do, they don't understand why you're reaching out to them. Um, and so it can vary, you can, you know, have someone tell you to stop texting them, which you should immediately do. Uh, or um, someone, it might be someone who wants to become more familiar with your campaign or your organization. Um, but you're more likely with voter turnout, for instance, to have 50% uh, higher voter turnout results 
when you're texting a warm list for GOTV than a cold list. So once again, uh, you're always going to have a, a lot more um, results and response rates, um, and especially when it comes to voter turnout um, with a warm list over a cold list. Okay. Now let's dig into the real nuts and bolts here. And that's peer-to-peer -peer versus broadcast texting. A lot of the time um, when I am talking to an organization and I ask them if they have a texting program, whether it's uh, broadcast or peer-to-peer, -peer, they say, oh, we use Hustle. They didn't know whether it was peer-to-peer -peer or broadcast. They just knew they used Hustle for their texting program, right? So this is really important to understand the benefits of either or um, for, your, for your texting program. And we're gonna go over some key things that you need to acknowledge first before you really start figuring out what type of texting tool you wanna to use. So number one, you wanna ask who your audience is. A common misconception is that texting is best for, um, for younger folks, um, usually folks who are uh, Gen Z, uh, Gen Y, and Gen X. Um, and based on this chart, you would think the same, but actually the largest growing uh, demographic of texters is boomers. So senior citizens um, are actually now texting at higher rates and growing in text, using text more and more. If you look at my family's texting thread, you'll see my parents text a whole lot more than my sister and I. So um, when it comes to texting, there is no difference um, in terms of reaching folks by age. In fact, I found that um, older folks who are more likely to respond and engage with you over text than a younger person is. So when you're figuring out your audiences, you wanna ask a couple questions. Number one, am I trying to reach voters? Are we trying to reach voters in a specific district for a political campaign or ballot initiative? Um, you wanna ask, do I have a relationship with this audience? If so, what is that relationship, right? This brings up in that cold versus warm texting question, right? Do I already have mobile opt-ins? Some people have started collecting mobile opt-ins before they've even started uh, a mobile program, which is, is smart in a lot of ways. And we can talk about other ways um, we need to work on that. So once you've figured out who your audience is, right? We need to figure out what your needs are and your goals are with reaching this audience. So what are your program or campaign goals? Are we gonna organize call-in campaigns as part of this? Are we gonna have rapid response moments? Are we using mobile for volunteer organizing, supporter engagement, fundraising, GOTV, advocacy, any matter of things? Once you identify the different ways that you plan on need it using mobile, um, that will then take you to your next question. What are your resources? So first off, people, capacity, right? Um, you wanna figure out number one, do I have one staff member who can manage this? Do I have a bunch of staff who can send peer-to-peer -peer texts, right? Um, do I have staff who have the time to train volunteers to send texts? Um, so you wanna figure out, number one, what type of capacity you have. Maybe you're a campaign that has a lot of volunteers and maybe you're a campaign that is very bare bones, right? And that brings us to time, right? So do your staff have time to train volunteers to send these text messages? Um, does your staff have time to learn a new platform? Um, other key things with time. Uh, how long is the campaign you're trying to run? If it's a political campaign, is it a special election? Do you only have two months? Uh, or do you have an entire year or longer? Um, this will make you decide different types of platforms. Some platforms allow month by month. Some platforms require that you sign for six months to a year. So that will be a huge identifier um, as well. Next up is cost and money, right? Not every campaign or organization has a large budget. There are different tools for various costs, right? And depending on the audience you're trying to text, 
because you are unlike email paying per text, right? With email, right? Gmail doesn't charge us two cents to send a text, right? Um, but Verizon charges fees, T-Mobile charges fees, and then we have to pay the folks who are allowing us to send those messages to those carriers, right? So typically a text message can cost uh, around one to two cents. So if you have a very large list that can get expensive, right? And then of course, some platforms have additional costs because of the functionality they're providing. And we're gonna get into that as well. So now we're gonna go and break down the key differences between peer-to-peer -peer and broadcast. So first of all, again, we're, when we're talking about the platform itself, Peer-to-peer -peer texting is strictly one-on-one -on -one messaging. Now they do use an application to send those messages. So it's not using your individual phone um, and your own phone number to send those messages. That is relational organizing, which is a totally different uh, type of messaging that is newer to the space um, and largely not as effective um, yet um, as peer-to-peer -peer broadcast. So, when we're doing peer-to-peer, -peer, we're using a texting platform that's giving a number that these messages are coming from, so it's not your personal phone, and it is bringing up the message for you to send, right? So you don't have to type it in every time. And literally, you're just pressing send, but you still have to press send if you're sending a thousand messages a thousand times, right? Now, um, it's typically done with a long code or regular 10-digit phone number. Um, though it can also be done with a toll-free number. Now, broadcast also is application to persons. So instead of an application being used to send to one person, the application is being used to send one message out to thousands or hundreds or millions, right? So it's almost, think of it almost like an email platform. Basically, in, in effect, it is doing the same thing. You're sending a blast text out to multiple people at once. And it's usually done via a web application. And typically we advise you use a short code, um, which again is that six digit number that's approved by all the carriers for mass text because your messages will get out quicker. And some broadcast platforms can actually be a full CRM and offer a lot of functionality that peer-to-peer -peer platforms don't. Now, my tip here is beware broadcast texting platforms that use a long code or regular phone number to send text. I mentioned this before. They're basically playing Russian roulette with your, with your money and your list. So to give you an example, an organization I know that does uh, a lot of uh, grassroots organizing and fundraising, uh, recently uh, in the last two years was told by their donation management system that they use that they're offering text messaging as part of the system. And so she decided to test it out. And she sent one message out to eight of her staff members. So she sent a bulk message to eight people who she knew. Only four of them received it. And that's because carriers have two types of filters for deliverability, and this is very important. For deliverability, there is a A to P filter, and there is a uh, spam filter, similar to email, but not quite the same. So when you're sending from a local, a regular long code or phone number, you are running into both of those types of filters. So if you're not stopped by the A to P filter, meaning you're sending a message from a platform on a long code to more than one person, you could also get stopped by that spam filter, which again, every carrier has a different algorithm, similar to how email platforms have different uh, algorithms that change up regularly. Um, the difference is with an email spam filter, your messages go into an inbox, a spam box, right? For texting, your messages are completely blocked. And the only reason my friend was able to determine that half of her messages didn't go through is because she was able to follow up with every one of her employees. Now, if you're sending out to a large group, you're not gonna be able to do that. Um, and the key 
the key thing with long codes is that you don't get mass deliverability stats because it's not meant to uh, report that out. It's meant to report one-on-one -on -one deliverability. So you might be spending money on messages that are not going through and you wouldn't even know it. So again, if you're doing broadcast texting, make sure you use a short code or a toll-free number. Now toll-free numbers, again, um, are a little bit slower. And the other reason folks use short code over toll-free um, if they can is because toll-free still can hit that spam filter, right? So think of it as a highway, right? We have one for long codes, one for toll free, and one for short codes. The long codes get hit by a toll um, that has an A to P filter and a spam filter, okay? The toll free goes past, doesn't have a toll for A to P, but does have a spam filter, whereas short codes just go free sailing. Um, so that is the, the key difference there and why we use one for peer-to-peer -peer and one for broadcast. Capacity. We talked a little about this earlier when we we're talking about our resources, right? For peer-to-peer, -peer, you need multiple people. You need a staff um, with a lot of time on their hands or the ability to train a lot of volunteers to send those messages out. And this is not completely impossible. <laughs> Obviously, I'm running a campaign right now with thousands of texters texting. So, but sometimes it can be harder for de depending on what you have um, available and the time constraints you have, right? So when you think about your people, right? Do I have enough folks on, uh, on staff or volunteers to get these messages out? Do we have time to train them? To, or does our staff have time to send them? And then do we have the, mo the money? Money is time, right? So do we wanna be sp spending um, money on our staff hours to send texts, right? Um, for broadcast, you can have a single person responsible for your program, similar to an email program, right? And you'd wanna have another person at, trained as a backup on how to send those text messages. And for resources, again, you need one person. Um, Messages go out much quicker, right? You don't have to spend an hour sending send on on every message. So a thousand messages in an hour versus uh, sending one message out in two minutes to thousands of people in two minutes. And then money, right? So some broadcast platforms are more affordable and some are more expensive. And that's something you have to, to measure. Next up is opt-in, and this is the key reason most people use peer-to-peer -peer versus broadcast texting. So for peer-to-peer, -peer, the opt-in is not mandatory. In fact, we just had a decision from the FCC that says that peer-to-peer -peer texting does not have to follow the TCPA, which we'll talk about in a second, uh, regulations, and therefore do not have to get an opt-in, okay? So again, they're not subject to those same FCC opt-in requirements. And this is great for those cold audiences, voters um, who you don't have relationship with. Right now I'm running a texting program to reach folks to complete the census. Those, that's a cold list, perfect for peer-to-peer -peer texting. Now broadcast, again, very similar to an email program, right? The opt-in is mandatory. So you um, need to get consent to text people. And this makes them more of a warm text, right? Because they are asking to be informed by your campaign or your organization. And that's because they are subject to FCC regulations for bulk messaging. And there's particular legal disclaimer language you have to include in all your opt-ins. And opt-ins can occur from web forms. So you just add it at, uh, as a disclaimer um, before people press submit that by giving their mobile number, they're agreeing to get texts from you, right? Keywords, like we, we talked about before, you can text a keyword to your short code. And lastly, events. So having people at events um, collect opt-ins uh, via web forms, via keyword, lots of different ways. And we're gonna talk more about that in a little bit. 
Now, my tip to you on opt-ins is to use your peer-to-peer -peer texting program for acquisition to your broadcast mobile list. So for instance, if you're texting voters and you're IDing voters via text, which we're doing more and more now because of COVID, right? Because we can't do that door to door. Um, so if we're IDing voters and we ID someone as a one, I'm gonna say, hey, uh, would you like to get election updates from the campaign via text? And if they say yes, I'm gonna opt them in. There's a little more involved with that, but I'm gonna opt them in and I'm gonna add them to my broadcast texting list. And the reason I'm gonna do that is because typically broadcast texting costs less per text. And this has been in flux lately. So these numbers are based off of numbers that I have from, uh, from text through and hustle, which were the two predominant peer to peer texting platforms. Um, and, but now we're seeing some more affordable options. So take this with a grain of salt, because again, you have to look into the options, look into the cost. Um, it's going to vary, but for peer to peer texting, typically you can either pay per text or pay per contact per month. Um, so unlimited text to that contact for the month or per text. Um, and if you were sending text to 100,000 folks every month, uh, so we're sending um, 100,000 messages per month, it would cost you about $6,000 at eight cents a text for peer-to-peer -peer texting. For broadcast, it would cost you about $2,000 to send the same number of messages over the course of that month. Now, some larger broadcast platforms don't allow for month to month. Um, so, but there are smaller ones that do. Peer to peer typically does allow for month to month texting. Now my tip here again, and I mentioned this at the beginning, no list is the same. You should do the math on your own. And now there are more and more options out there for peer to peer texting that don't cost eight cents or more per text. So there are more affordable options. Um, but weigh all of your resources and figure out time, capacity, and money. Um, some of the best programs use both peer-to-peer -peer and broadcast texting. Lastly, functionality. So peer-to-peer -peer is typically very basic functionality. We can do dynamic content. So what that means is like, dear first name, uh, I'm so-and-so with so-and-so organization, right? we can add emojis, but that's kind of where we draw the line. Whereas some broadcast texting platforms allow for logic-based messaging and flows. So they could get a message for, if they reply yes or no, they get a message for yes and a message for no automatically. So you don't even have to do a thing. Um, there's also some platforms that have patch through calling functionality. Um, and you can do a lot more um, with that, that kind of functionality, but again, Every platform is different, but you need to ask those questions. Number one, if this, are you using long codes, toll free or short code, right? Uh, number two, uh, what type of functionality do you offer? Can I, can I uh, set up message flows? Um, things like that. Okay, now this is for you to take a screenshot. This is a quick breakdown of everything we just covered so you can refer back to it. So feel free to uh, take a screenshot real quick um, of this. I'll give you a, a second. And I'm gonna ask now, uh, do we have any questions? Michael asks, what are the more affordable peer-to-peer -peer options? I'm gonna get to that in just a second. Don't worry, I got you covered. Okay. Before we jump into platforms, I do wanna talk a bit about compliance. We just talked about the fact that broadcast texting or bulk texting requires opt-ins, right? That is because they are held to the Telephone Consumer Protection Act or the TCPA, which is um, regulated by the FCC, okay? So for broadcast texting or bulk texting, right? We need to make sure we collect opt-ins and we need to make sure we also opt people out who request it. There's another regulatory body called the CTIA. Now they're not a government entity, but they're actually an association of all the carriers. And the CTIA, um, number one for 
bulk messaging further enforces the TCPA. So the TCPA, if you violate it, you'll get fined by the FCC. The CTIA, if you violate the, uh, the TCPA, they will shut down your, your short code or the number you're using to text from. So you don't wanna cross them. So again, this is the association of all the carriers. It's the governing body and they put out reg requirements for texting um, and, and robocalls and things like that. So the CTIA on top of uh, holding true to the TCPA with opt-in requirements are also the ones who set up requirements for peer-to-peer -peer texting and what's considered spam or uh, requirements for opt-outs for peer-to-peer one-on-one texting, okay? So you might have heard in the news recently that Trump's peer-to-peer uh, -peer fundraising campaign around July 4th was shut down. This was shut down by the carriers for two key reasons. Number one, they first saw his messages as being spam. So they noted that a certain number or several numbers were sending the exact same message and it was getting flagged as spam by some of their um, some of their customers number one number two a lot of those folks hadn't been opted in uh, because it was a, a cold list um, and when they asked to not receive text messages anymore they they didn't comply with that so um, that's two and number three they weren't actually using a peer-to-peer -peer texting platform to send these messages. They were using a tool that is considered an auto dialer of sorts to make their messages look like they're peer-to-peer -peer when they're not, um, and therefore were blocked from sending messages um, as peer-to-peer -peer from a long code because they were basically bulk sending from a long code, okay? So really key thing for broadcast, make sure you're getting your opt-ins. For both broadcast and peer-to-peer, -peer, make sure you honor opt-outs. If they don't wanna get texts, take them off your list, okay? All right, platform options. So we got about 20 minutes left. I'm gonna race through these because I have a whole other section I wanna talk, uh, talk about. So progressive broadcast texting options, unfortunately, there aren't that many, um, which kills me. Um, so Upland Mobile Messaging, also known as Mobile Commons, is currently the large um, broadcast texting platform in the space. They allow for one-on-one um, -on -one texting, bulk texting, as well as patch through calling, logic-based messaging. But they only work with organizations that can send 100,000 messages or more a month. Smart as a fox, and this is the only time I'm gonna mention it, I resell mobile commons to smaller organizations and make it more affordable. So I have plans for 5,000 messages a month, 10,000, 20,000, as opposed to 100,000 to use that same very robust functionality platform for broadcast texting. Now there are nonpartisan options uh, to Tango, simple texting and easy texting. Now with both uh, the two options I mentioned before, if you are 501c3, you can be on a shared short code which means you don't have to pay for your own short code. For Tatango, you're required to purchase your own short code. Simple texting offers toll-free texting. Easy texting currently offers a shared short code, but that will change because like I mentioned, only 501c3s are grandfathered in by, by the CTIA, the carriers, to do um, bulk texting from a short code. Uh, as a shared short code. So easy texting um, may be switching to toll free very soon. So simple texting, easy texting are more affordable options. To Tango, you have to pay for your own short code, but they all it is also more affordable. And these are more bare bones, basic uh, blast texting uh, and, and also keyword opt-ins, okay? But they don't have uh, patch through calling or logic-based messaging uh, functionality. Now, there are a bunch of all-in-one tools that you probably are familiar with a lot of these, right? Phone to Action, Every Action, Action Network, New Mode, Civi CRM. Um, all of these um, have recently added a bulk texting functionality 
or have had one, Phone to Action's been around for a while. They all offer very, very basic broadcast texting um, and they offer it through toll free or you can purchase a short code. Uh, I believe Phone to Action is still offering shared short codes for 501c3s, but you have to double check. All of these just basically offer one-off messaging, basic blast messaging. Um, only Phone to Action currently, and New Mode might be soon offering keyword opt-ins. Um, and Action Network does offer a connection of their texting program to ladders. So they do have logic-based messaging, but no keyword opt-ins. I know that's a lot. Um, feel free to ask me later on after the training uh, if you're interested in any of these. Um, but the functionality just varies across the board. And what I like to say is that basically when you try to do everything, you don't do everything well. And that's the case with a lot of these platforms. It's great that they're offering the option, but it's not the best texting functionality out there. Um, and then Give Lively is a free fundraising management tool that offers uh, text to give options via short code for free. So if you're a 501c3, I highly recommend you check them out. Okay, so peer to peer. Get Through and Hustle have been the two predominant uh, texting platforms for peer to peer in the space. Now, Get Through charges eight cents per text. Hustle, I recently heard quoted someone 20 cents per text. I don't know what they're thinking. They're very expensive, but they have a platform and they have a team, a support team that's really um, great. And so if you can get a good deal that's under eight cents a text, they could be an option. I know the Movement Collaborative has a current contract with Hustle uh, so that their members get a much lower rate. So that could be an option. Uh, also partisan options are MoveOn ha has a open source peer-to-peer -peer texting tool called Spoke. I'm currently using it for um, one of my campaigns. Uh, and there you can either build your own for your organization, but you need you know developer uh, on board to be able to build that for you and manage it. Um, or there are now vendors out there like Scale to Win and Resistance Labs who um, will let, let you pay them to use the Spoke platform. Um, so they've monetized the open source platform to make it more available to the masses if they don't have a developer on staff or, or can hire one. And these programs are, these platforms typically charge wholesale costs um, between um, less than one cent and two to three cents a text. Text out is through open progress and they charge between six to nine cents. And some of these platforms like text out and resistance labs offer offer for an extra fee that they will have their paid texters or volunteers send the text for you. Now some non person options for peer to peer are call hub. Um, and the GOP options, um, which you guys don't really care about, but are Open Sesame and Rumble Up. Um, so that's who Trump uses. Also, Trump uses to Tango, but so does the DCCC. So, okay, we're gonna go really quick through all this because we only have 15 minutes left. So the pieces of the mold puzzle, number one, quality content, right? You want to be putting out messages that people actually want to read. <laughs> um, don't be the Biden campaign who had literally sent me a fundraising ask every single day, sometimes twice a day via text, okay? Integration with your organizational and digital strategy, right? So don't try to recreate the wheel when you start a texting program. A lot of people treat their texting program as this other. Really what you should be thinking about when you're you know, putting together an email uh, or social media is how can we take this action or this announcement or whatever we're doing with our strategy and include it in text. So make sure it's fully integrated into the work that you're already doing and not making it a second thought. A lot of organizations either uh, do this um, and they don't realize they're doing it. Authenticity, right? This is a very personal medium and you want to have an authentic voice, right? You want to sound like a real person when you're going back and forth over text. It's, again, it's a very personal medium for folks for communications. 
targeted engagement, just like any email program, right? You want to do list segmentation. Um, there are times when you want to message the entire list, but there are other times when you want to send to a certain segment about an event in their area, or um, you want to segment to folks who've taken action previously. You want to look at those data and analytics and do experimentation to ensure that um, you are using the right voice, that you're using the right language, that you're sending at the right time of day. Do all of the A-B testing and take that into account when you um, run your next campaign via text. So here's some list growth tips. For broadcast texting, make sure you have mobile opt-ins on every single one of your actions and forms. This is an example of a call action from Planned Parenthood. And under that call me button is this legal language. By providing my cell phone number, I agree to receive calls and texts to that number from Planned Parenthood organizations that may be automatically dialed or pre-recorded with information on Planned Parenthood issues and ways to get involved. Message and data rates may apply. Text stop to opt out. Help for more info. No purchase necessary expect four messages per month, or you can just say recurring messages. So that's the legal language that the TCPA and the CTIA require you include for your opt-ins. Next up is rapid response moments. On the right, you can see an ad that is put out by Every Town for Gun Safety. Unfortunately, every time there was a mass shooting, they sent out an ad like this on Facebook that said, text enough to 64433. And they did actually get a lot of opt-ins because people are pissed every time this happens. Um, and this year, surprisingly, maybe it's underreported because everything that's happening this year, but usually we see multiple uh, shootings happen within a year, right? Next up is event calls to action with opt-in. Familiar face, our new vice presidential candidate, right? When Kamala announced her run for president, she not only in her speech told people to text fearless to 70785, but you can see on the sign on her podium during her entire speech that was um, broadcasted out everywhere um, on the internet, um, on mega screens, right? Uh, asked people to text her keyword to their short code. And she got a ton of opt-ins from just from her announcement. You can also at rallies have your person have whoever's speaking from your organization do that. And you can put it on your signs that you're handing out to folks to use at rallies as well. Social media. Um, when the Hobby Lobby decision came down, we created this graphic for our Facebook and Twitter um, pages that told people to text dissent to 69866 to stand with Ruth Bader Ginsburg's scathing dissent, right? So we're giving people an action and a way to also opt in and engage. Paid ads um, as a call to action. No Kid Hungry every summer uh, has a text food to 877877 um, on bus ads, on people talking on the radio, at the bottom of the screen um, for newscasts, um, they'll have that text food to 877-877 so that people can put in their address and get information on where their kids can get meals over the summer near them. Next up, best practices. Number one, always identify your organization. This is very important, required by the CTIA. You don't want to send a message to someone and they don't know who you are, right? Number two, make it personal, right? We talked about authenticity. You'll notice at the end of this message, I sign off as Sandy at PP Action. When I ran Planned Parenthood's texting program, people would actually come up to me and realize who I was and give me a hug because they've been getting my text messages for two plus years um, because they felt like they knew me, right? It's a very personal medium. And we found via text, if you include a person's name versus just the organization, um, people are more likely to actually respond. Next up is engage your list, right? Ask them a question, have them respond. You'll notice in my last um, message, I asked people to respond stand, to stand with us. 
And I know that's ableist um, and that's something we probably wouldn't do now, but that was a little while back. Um, and you wanna make it exclusive and fun. So the human rights campaign, for instance, when the marriage equality decision was set to come down, they told people to text marriage to their short code so that they could be the first to know when, um, when the decision came down. So they made it really exclusive and, and it was exciting news for so many people. Kiss, keep it short and simple. You only have 160 characters. If your text goes over 160 characters, number one, you're paying for two SMS messages. Number two, depending on the carrier and the type of phone, your messages might come in the wrong order. And that is a really bad user experience. So don't do that. Also, people are more likely to read shorter messages. Sandy, five minutes and three questions. Okay, let's get to the questions. Is MMS only limited to images or can you use video? Okay, so video is not currently something you can do on MMS. You can link to a YouTube and sometimes certain phones will have that YouTube appear. But um, RCS, which is Rich Communication Services, is the new type of texting that will soon be available everywhere, um, but not yet, will incorporate video. But MMS does not allow video. The only way you can send video um, is by a GIF, like a very, very short video via MMS or a link via an SMS or MMS to a YouTube or uh, landing page with a video. What now, if you are a 501c5, such as a union? Yep, uh, AFT, uh, a a uh, AFL, SEIU all have texting programs. Um, I I'm not sure, are you asking about short codes? Um, you would need to purchase your own short code um, or use toll free uh, for broadcasts and then of course local for peer to peer. Can multiple electoral campaigns say three candidates running for local office in nearby districts share a short code? No, so short codes need to be approved for one individual, one organization or campaign. So for instance, the Biden campaign has their own short code. Uh, it will not be approved it will, if it will be used by multiple campaigns, it also takes 10 weeks to get a short code approved. That is the end of the questions and you have three minutes. Great, so we're gonna try to get through some of this. Um, so these are some text messaging mistakes to avoid. Number one, no clickable link. So you notice on the right, um, I can see my link, I can click on it, great. Now, if I put a link without any characters after it on iPhones, this is what it looks like. So once again, Notice how NARAL is after the link. That is why on an iPhone, I can see my link. If I don't put any characters after my link, even like a period would have fixed this, right? I get this tap to load preview. And what happens, uh, even the largest organizations do this. Um, now I have to click tw twice to get to where you, you want me to go. And some people see this as really suspect and are less likely to click on it. Not identifying your organization. This is a text I got. I have no idea who sent it to me because they did not identify and they're on a shared short code. Too many messages. Now, I still have text in here from Kamala, but Biden is worse. <laughs> um, and now keep in mind, some folks have tested these things and they think that they're making more money by having more messages. Um, and sometimes yes, but the real, the real question is engagement and people forget that. Um, so for instance, these are the messages I got from Kamala. At the time it was eight in one month. Now I get one to two messages a day from Biden's campaign. And they're almost always uh, fundraising ass. On, I went too fast. Um, now, this is a typical tactic that I'm seeing with the DCCC, um, which is apparently going through to presidential campaigns, um, that they're treating texting like email um, because people are less likely to opt out because they care about the candidate. Um, so they see that as a win and they're making money um, because they're sending a bazillion fundraising ass. But the thing is- Third second, Sandy. Okay, the thing is, they're gonna be ignored um, by folks when they ask for them to volunteer or do something else. 
Uh, not engaging. The DNC is not asking me to do anything. Um, make sure you're you're asking for information or engaging. Not sending to a non sending to a non responsive landing page. This is from Hustle. Hustle sent me to this page to start doing Hustle. Imagine trying to fill that out on your phone. Honorable mention, Julio and Castro. I opted out and I still got text messages from him. This is a huge TCPA violation. Don't do this. Honorable mention, Julian Castro. They sent me an email as a text. Again, the DCCC thinks that this is a tactic that works. I, dis I disagree, unless your, full your only tactic is to raise money and you've tested it. Most people wanna use texting for more than just fundraising and you should be using it for more than just fundraising. Okay, uh, broadcast best use cases. Announcements, advocacy, events, education surveys and quizzes, 